Hey everybody, welcome to another Friday Facebook Live. This is Living Inside Out with Daniel Amstetz, and I'm so grateful that you've taken time to join us again today. Uh, thank you for those of you who have been commenting and sending in questions and, and uh, comments. We appreciate that so much. This is interactive, and so we also have prayer ministers standing by. You can reach them by calling 719-635-1111. If you do want someone to pray with you, or if you've got a concern on your heart, uh, man, please reach out. We love you, and we are just excited to have this opportunity to connect with you. So every week, we are talking about New Covenant worship and living life in Christ, and what this looks like as a New Covenant believer compared to somebody who was living in the Old Covenant. You know, nobody in the Old Covenant had the Spirit of God living in them. They would, uh, from time to time, have the Spirit of God come upon them for a designated task or for a particular calling, but nobody had the Spirit of God living in them. And today, we as New Covenant believers are so blessed and so privileged to have the Holy Spirit actually living in us, to have the very presence of God living on the inside of us today. What a blessing to be able to have this kind of life and Jesus said he came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. And so, yeah, we are so blessed to be living in this covenant that is a covenant that is a better covenant, as Jesus said, with better promises. And, you know, I've often said that if we're living under a better covenant with better promises, then there has to be a better way to worship and a better way to pray. And we certainly have found that, haven't we, by worshiping in spirit and in truth. So... Today, I want to talk to you about transformational worship, something the Lord has laid on my heart several years ago, and I entitled this today, Transformational Worship. What is it? <laughs> so let's get into the Word of God today and find out what we're talking about. So what, what's happening is a lot of worship today is informational, and that's important. It has its place, and some of the worship is inspirational. And that is important as well. That has its place. But very little worship is actually transformational. And I believe that's God's best. And we're going to talk about that and why that even matters today. So worship that is informational, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, the lyrics that you sing contain information. They contain revelation. Or in some cases, not. <laughs> right? But they are, it is informational in that the lyrics communicate doctrine. The lyrics communicate truth. And so it's very important that we pay attention to our lyrics. What is it that we're actually singing? Is it scriptural or is it just poetic? I had an issue with a song years ago where I contacted the worship leader and I said, uh, this isn't even scriptural. Why are we singing these lyrics? And the response back was, well, we're not trying to be scriptural. We're trying to be poetic. And I thought, well, you know what? Go ahead and try to be poetic. But what you're going to produce is wood, hay, and stubble. It's not going to produce more spirit and more truth. And that's what we're after. Amen? So our lyrics are informational and our lyrics matter. And I like to say it this way. If you wouldn't preach it from the pulpit, then why on earth would you ever sing it from the stage? Why would you communicate in your lyrics information that goes contrary to the Word of God? So informational worship, it does matter. It's absolutely important. Uh, did you know that we actually can teach through our songs? Yeah, the Bible talks about this. We're going to look at it here in a minute. But this is why, uh, you know, what people call the song service, which really is, is an old term for just worship together. But, you know, when people are singing songs, those songs have the ability to teach. They teach doctrine, they teach truth, you know, they teach theology. But I'm telling you, they do teach. And so it really does matter. It's all included in the words that we sing. So let's look at the scripture here. It's found in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. It says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ, in other words, the word of God, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now watch this. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So when we are 
singing our psalms, our hymns, and our spiritual songs. And sometime we'll get into that again and why those three categories are completely separate and yet work together. Okay? It's kind of like coffee and creamer and sugar. You pour them all into the same cup and you enjoy the coffee. And this is the way our songs, our hymns, and our spiritual songs work together. So uh, he says that uh, the writer Apostle Paul says to the Colossian church, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, or teaching and encouraging one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So again, our lyrics matter and they are informational. So uh, then we also have worship that is inspirational. And you know, this is also a very important category. When music is involved in our worship, and I say that like that because worship is not music, but music can be used in worship to God. And many people think that worship is music. But it's not really. Music can be used to worship God, but worship is really about our relationship with God. That's really what worship is all about. So worship should be inspirational as well, especially when music is involved. Nobody is blessed by mediocre music. I'm just telling you, that doesn't bless anybody. Excellence, on the other hand, really does speak. Excellence will open up doors for you and it grabs our attention. It makes us sit up and kind of take notice, right? When there's excellence, we're like, oh, what, what's happening here? This is good. But mediocre doesn't really bless anybody. So inspirational worship is absolutely very important. You know, if the sound is not clear, or as scripture says, if the sound is uncertain, it doesn't bless anybody. And honestly, it's confusing. And God is never the author of confusion. I want to share another scripture verse with you, and you may not have thought of it in this way, but let's look at it together. Out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 and verse 8, it says, Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Wow, there's a lot in that verse. And you know, as a worship leader, it's really important to me and to my team to have good sound. And the sound technicians are part of that worship team as well. We're all one big team together. But when the sound is not good, we're not communicating what's actually coming out of people's hearts. And if a if a piano sounds like a, a, a set of drums, or if a bass guitar sounds like an acoustic guitar, well then we've got a problem because nobody really knows what's going on. And when you have an uncertain sound, it produces confusion. And here the Apostle Paul in writing says, if a trumpet were to sound, but it doesn't sound like a trumpet, who's gonna even know to prepare for battle? That was how they made the battle call back in the day, was using a trumpet. So, when Saul, in the Old Covenant, called for a musician to help soothe his tormented heart, you know what he did? He called for a skillful musician. He didn't call for just anybody to show up and, and you know, try to do something. No, he called for a skillful musician. So, excellence really does matter, and inspiration is an important part of what we do. So, information or informational worship and inspirational worship both matter, but not near as much as transformational worship does. Okay, so whenever we encounter an unchanging God who deeply loves us, we should be the ones who change. Amen? We should be the ones who are transformed. Let's look at it. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I plead with you, brethren or believers, by the mercies of God, not by yourself, but by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, or another word for that word service is your reasonable worship, uh, verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world or to this age, now here it is, but be transformed 
By what? In this case, by the renewing of your mind. This is how you can be transformed, by the renewing of your mind, so that you can prove or experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, if you want to experience the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, the only way you're going to do it is by getting into the Word of God and renewing your mind to God's ways. And when we do that, instead of being conformed to the ways of the world or the ways of this age, now we begin to experience transformation instead of being conformed to the world. That's powerful. You know, this is the same word that is used when a um, caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly. That word is metamorphosis in the Greek. And we go through this process of a complete transformation in the area of our soul. Hallelujah. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is another place where we find how we can be transformed. We're mostly, most of us are familiar with Romans 12, 1 and 2. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, we find another way that corresponds with renewing our mind. Let's take a look at it. It says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, But we all, with unveiled face, hallelujah, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, here it is again, are being transformed into the same image, the same image of what? The same image that we are beholding. And we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So you may not have realized this before, but transformation happens not only by renewing your mind, but it also happens by beholding Jesus. When you behold him, you become like him. So not only are we transformed by truth, but we are also transformed, as it says here, by the Spirit of the Lord. So again, we see this beautiful combination of worship in spirit and in truth. Both worship in spirit and truth should cause us to be experiencing transformation. But let me ask you a question today. Why aren't we seeing more of this in our culture today? Why are we seeing so much informational worship and so much, maybe not so much, inspirational worship and so little transformational worship? Well, Jesus told us in John chapter 4, he said that the only way to worship was in spirit and in truth. And we've talked about that many times. But can you see in these two examples from Romans 12 and then 2 Corinthians 3, how that we experience transformation in spirit and in truth by the word of God and by beholding the image. And as we behold Jesus, that image is what we become conformed to by the spirit of the Lord. It's very important that we are beholding him. We are looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So transformational worship, honestly, it should be the norm for the Spirit-filled believer. We are constantly in the process of being transformed and being renewed in the realm of our soul. Hallelujah. This is really so opposite from the ways of the world, where we are constantly being encouraged to exalt self and believe in yourself and listen to your body and what your body wants as opposed to listening to the Spirit of God and going with what the Spirit of God says and then telling your body what it's going to do instead of the other way around. Instead of exalting self, we have no confidence in self anymore. Our confidence is in Jesus. Hallelujah. So no wonder most people are so stressed out all the time. I mean, it doesn't surprise you know, me and, and probably you. It doesn't surprise us at all, does it? We have to ask ourselves, who are we being conformed to? If we are living in a constant state of being uh, stressed out all the time, we are not being transformed. Instead, we're being conformed to this age. We are being conformed to the ways of the world. 
So are we being conformed to the Word of God, or are we being conformed to the world? But the question remains, is our worship really transformational? It could be, but is it? The word transformed is the same word that is used when Jesus was transfigured in front of the disciples in Matthew chapter 17, and verse 2. And you know, when this transfiguration happened, or this transformation happened, it says in verse 2 of, of uh, Matthew 17, watch this, it says, His face shone, or was shining, like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Wow. He was transformed right in front of them. And so we realize that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds and also by beholding Jesus, by seeing him. We realize that worship is the one thing that must be done in spirit and in truth, and transformational worship should now be the standard. You know, I believe that the Lord is desiring us to experience transformation in our lives on a daily basis. And when you realize that many of us have settled for informational worship or inspirational worship, when God's got so much more for us. You know, we say uh, this verse a lot in our lives together, but it's so true because in John 10, 10, it says that Jesus came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. This is the supernatural life of God that is literally living in us, and our life is now in Him. So transformation should really become a new normal for every one of us as believers, and we should be transformed from glory to glory, not from disaster to disaster or from stress to stress, amen? But rather, we should be conformed to His image and not conformed to the ways of the world. So my question to you today is, what's your worship life really like? What's your worship life like? Are you really being transformed or are you really just being conformed? After Jesus was crucified and risen from the dead, but not yet ascended to the Father, Jesus had one more time, think about this, he had one more time to pour into his disciples and listen to what happened in this encounter. I mean, if you knew that you had one more time and you had some really important things to say before you physically left to go up to heaven, you know, what would you say? Well, Matthew 28, verses 16 and 17, it tells us this. Then the 11 disciples, you say, wait a minute, I thought there were 12. Well, there, there was, but Judas, remember, committed suicide. He hung himself. And so now there's only 11 disciples left. And the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. They went away to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. So they're, they've gone to a place where Jesus appointed for them to go. And then it says this. I, I was just so blown away by this the first time I really saw this. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him but some doubted. Does that sound like today? Does that sound like what's happening on a regular basis? What was it that they were doubting? Maybe they were doubting if they could go on without him. Man, I, that's probably where I would have been if I had been doubting in that moment. I would have been like, how are we going to do this without you, Jesus? With, with you leaving I know you told us that we're gonna, it's gonna be better that you go and, and you're gonna send the comforter and he's gonna be our teacher and our helper. But having not experienced that yet, what, what are we gonna do? Jesus, how could you leave us like this? And so could it have been that they were doubting that they could go on without him? We don't really know. We don't really know for sure. But what we see is that even an encounter with Jesus didn't solve the issues of their heart. Wow. Even an encounter with the risen Christ did not solve the issues that were in their heart. Some of them came away from that encounter completely 
unchanged. And some of them worshipped. Some of them were transformed. And some of them were completely unchanged. How could this be? Same disciple, same Jesus, same encounter, and yet some worshipped and some doubted. It was the condition of their heart. Really, that's what it is. It was their unbelief. Some doubted, and doubt and unbelief will always rob you. It'll rob from you, but it'll rob what God is wanting for you. And this is how the enemy has access to us when we let him have access to us through unbelief and through fear and through all those other areas where the enemy loves to, to work and, and to do what he does as the father of lies. So how often do we come away from a worship time completely unchanged? How often do we come away from a time of worship with no transformation happening? In these moments, does worship just become an experience to help me feel better instead of a transformational worship? Was the worship the issue or was it me? Is it where my heart is? And I want to propose to you today that we oftentimes really give our worship teams a bad time because you know what? They just didn't move us like we thought they were supposed to. You know, we were hoping to sense the presence of God and we didn't sense anything. And, you know, doggone it, it's the, it's the fault of that worship team. You know, well, is it really? I mean, it could have been that they really did a, a terrible job uh, informationally and inspirationally. But listen, the bottom line is, it's your heart connecting with the heart of God. So where is your heart? What's going on in the issues of your heart? Are you doubting and entering into unbelief? Or are you being transformed as a result of that encounter that you're having with Jesus in spirit and in truth? You know, it's interesting when it comes to this area of music, because I say this humorously, but Jesus did not travel with a band. <laughs> I mean, think about it. He didn't have a band going around with him and establishing the atmosphere and everything just had to be, you know, holy, holy, holy and just perfect in order for the anointing to flow. No, listen, he didn't have any of that. And yet what we see Jesus doing is the most powerful thing that's ever happened on the face of the earth. And Jesus said, we can do those same works. So you know what? It's not up to all that peripheral stuff. No, it's really about our hearts and understanding that God has given us the ability in his grace to do what he's called us to do. He's given us the ability to actually be transformed in our worship encounters with the Lord. Hallelujah. So our heart is so important to God and the condition of our heart will determine the outcome. Again, Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what's going on in the inside of you? That even in a worship service, there would be people who are being blessed, and then maybe there's you that's just dealing with doubt and unbelief, and you're walking away completely unchanged. Or maybe you're the one who's just getting your socks blessed off, and the person next to you can't even figure out what's going on. How can that happen in the same worship service? with the same musicians, same people, it's because of the condition of our heart. What are you thinking about? Philippians 4, 8. Man, I tell you, it's one of my favorite verses. And it says basically, you know, what are, what are you thinking on? Think on these things, these things that are lovely and have a good report, the things that have virtue, the things that are praiseworthy. Amen? But our hearts are so overloaded and our minds are thinking about a lot of other stuff sometimes especially during a worship service. So what I'm about to tell you, I've experienced myself. And so I've seen it many times where two people can be in the same worship gathering and one person gets so blessed and ministered to and the other person feels empty and disappointed. Again, what's the difference? It's the same service, the same worship team, but two different worshipers. First of all, we have to make sure that our worship is new covenant worship. If our worship is not worship in spirit and in truth, then Jesus said our worship is in vain. We might as well not have done it. 
Let's look at it. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. He says this, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines of human commands. Teaching as doctrines, human commands. Wow, if that doesn't describe a lot of the worship that's happening today, I don't know what does. You know, the Apostle Paul said that the traditions of men can make void the power of God and that we should run from that kind of environment, not get connected to it, as so many people do. Philippians 3, I'm going to close with this today, but Philippians 3 verses 2 and 3 is such an interesting passage, and Paul is using so much sarcasm here when he writes this, because he's pretty much fed up with those Judaizers that have been following him around, trying to bring people back under the law again, and you know what? I can so appreciate how the Apostle Paul was feeling. Even though I haven't been where he's been and I haven't done what he's done by any means. But man, I just get so tired of people trying to put other people back under the law again. And the Apostle Paul writes here and he says in Philippians 3 verse 2 and 3, Beware of dogs. (laughs) And here, here the word dogs is metaphorically a man of an impure mind. So he's, he's, you know, he, you can feel the passion that he's coming out with. He says, beware of dogs, these people with impure minds. Beware of evil workers, he says. And, and in the Greek, it really means those who are deprived or worthless teachers. Beware. And then he says, lastly, beware of the mutilation. Wow. For we are the circumcision, watch this, who worship God in the spirit Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It was basically like saying, you know, you want to talk about circumcision and how circumcision makes you right with God? He says, all right, just beware of the mutilation. (laughs) I'm not going to go into more detail with that one. We're just going to leave that one alone. But you probably get the picture, right? So we worship God as Father in the Spirit. Number two, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. And number three, we have no confidence in the flesh. This is what new covenant worship looks like. And this is what transformational worship looks like. Hallelujah. I want to just exhort you today, encourage you today, that when you're worshiping God, let the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit and let the Word of God cause transformation in you. Stay long enough to let God transform you. Don't just jump in and jump back out again. It's not just informational, even though that has its place. It's not just inspirational, even though that's important as well. But God's highest design for us as believers, whether we're in a gathering together or whether we're just in our car or in our home office or wherever we are, that's the beauty of the new covenant. Because wherever we are, the presence of God is as well. And God wants us to be experiencing transformational worship on a regular basis. So my last scripture I want to share with you today in closing is 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. It says this, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You know what? The Holy Spirit has so much that he wants to commune with us. And this is what worship in spirit and in truth looks like. It's not just us speaking to God or singing to God, but it's God singing over us. It's God rejoicing over us with joy, dancing over us. It's God loving us and speaking over us. And whatever he's telling us, we have the right now to get up on the rooftops and shout it out. If there was ever a time when we needed to be understanding and plunging into the grace of God, And then also understanding the love of God and experiencing the love of God, letting God love us. And then lastly, the communion of the Holy Ghost. I think God's got a lot more for us. And you know what? I'm excited because right now when this crazy, crazy world that's around us is is going the direction that it is, the Bible says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And I believe that we are going to see powerful, powerful things happen as we come alive 
to the presence of God that's already living on the inside of us. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of our live today. I want to just pray for you and bless you today real quick as we wrap this up. I know our time is up. But Father, I just thank you for every person who's a part of our live today or who will be watching the archives. And I thank you, Lord God, for uh, placing the desire within their hearts, Lord, for transformational worship to become something that is uh, a, a desire in their hearts. Lord, something that they'll be able to walk in as a lifestyle, not a musical style, but an every day with you. Lord, thank you that you want us to be transformed so that we can be living in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of that image will flow our identity. And out of that identity will flow our God-given authority in the world today. And Father, thank you that you've given us the authority to do the works of Jesus. The same works that you did, we can be doing today all over the world because of you, because of your goodness and the price that you paid for us to be able to be in you. It's in you we live and move and have our being. And God, we are so grateful. We give you thanks and praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. We sure love you. And thank you for being a part of our live.